The circuit riding preacher used to ride across the land With a rifle on his saddle and a Bible in his hand He told the prairie people all about the promised land So he went riding, singing down the trail Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all alarms. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. The circuit riding preacher traveled through the mire and mud. Talked about the fiery furnace and Noah and the flood. He preached the way to heaven was by trusting in the blood. She went riding, singing down the trail. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. The circuit riding preacher slept in flea infested barns. Even then he felt the comfort of the everlasting arms to give him strength to travel on to churches, homes, and farms. He went riding, singing down the trail. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. Love lifted me. Love lifted me when nothing else could help. Love lifted me. The circuit riding preacher preached from off the stones of graves in open fields and smoky rooms and bad infested caves. Although the places changed, the word was always Jesus says. He went riding, singing down the trail. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine forevermore. There's a meeting up in heaven with the circuit riders there All rejoicing over their missions they fulfilled most everywhere And they're watching out for all the living circuit riders here As we go riding, singing down the trail Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah Glory, glory, hallelujah, as we go riding on. Now, some of you may be asking, what are circuit riders? Well, they were horseback riding preachers back in the 1800s that traveled the trails across the American frontier. They started riding in the late 1700s. That's when Bishop Francis Asbury arrived. He was 26 years old, and he was from Birmingham, England. You didn't say Birmingham, you said Birmingham, England. And it was the still capital of the world back in the 17th century and for many centuries to follow. That's probably why they named uh, our Birmingham in Alabama after Birmingham in England. Well, this young man had already been riding the circuit in England and preaching God's Word. Now, a circuit was an assigned path to follow as you rode your horse. It was a route of 500 to 800 miles, and of course it was called a circuit. And so they were called circuit riders. Sometimes it took uh, six months to a year to travel the circuit because you were told to be kind to your beast in the first discipline of the Methodist Church. 
not only to ride moderately every day, but to see to it with your own eyes that your horse was rubbed down and fed at the end of every day. That was your main mode of travel back then. Circuit riders were young people, usually not educated in universities or institutions. Uh, they were the common preacher for the common people, a lot of them just young, single teenagers. And they rode the trails faithfully. Uh, they took with them in their saddlebags the necessities that they needed, usually a set of riding clothes that were torn by the thorns along the trails and patched many times. And when they would arrive to preach at a church, they would put on an outfit like this that was a little bit nicer. Well, in their saddlebags, they carried with them the essentials. And of course, every circuit rider needed to carry the Holy Bible. And so uh, that was carried with them along the trail. And also along the trail, they would make sure, according to Charles Wesley and John Wesley, they told all the circuit riders to be sure to begin every service with a good hymn. And so they carried their hymn books. Now you'll notice that in this hymn book, along with many of them of that particular era, uh, there was no music notation, just words, the name of the hymn and a suggested tune at the top of each hymn. And so they would lead people in singing hymns. And of course, I'm portraying a Methodist Episcopal Church circuit rider from the 1800s. And we had the Book of Discipline to carry with us. It gave us the rules and expectations of every circuit rider. It also contained within here the service for Holy Communion, weddings, and funerals. Now, a circuit rider was probably paid only about $64 a year. With that meager salary, they would ride and hopefully depend upon the hospitality of people along the trail to give them a place to stay. And also along the way, they might carry some Bibles to sell, some hymn books, and perhaps sell a few pamphlets to help out along the way. Uh, they would preach, in many cases, outdoors. They would uh, preach on the back of an unhitched wagon. They would stand on a stump and preach. Uh, they would preach in someone's home. Uh, word would get out in the settlement that the circuit riding preacher was here, and they would gather and have a service in someone's cabin. And so back in those days, they were thrilled just to see someone come along the trail and to pray for them, pray for a good harvest season, pray for their protection. Uh, they would marry some young people along the way. In many cases, the circuit rider was kind of the news. As they would come down the trail, uh, they would share the stories that they would hear along the way. So circuit riders were a big part of our nation's early days, uh, starting in the colonial times, on through the War of Independence, and just before the Civil War, uh, all the way up into the 19th century. Bishop Francis Asbury had a lot to do with organizing the circuit riders. When he arrived in 1771, he saw that many people were living out in the wilderness, not in the major cities, and they needed spiritual help. And so he organized the circuit riders. Uh, there's a song that I would like to share with you that I wrote, and it's called, Go Ride That Trail. Some men heard the plea from Bishop Asbury. I've got a heavenly plan, needs a good horse and a godly man. The pay ain't the best, you surely won't get much rest. But earthly comforts don't matter to a faithful Rider. Go ride that trail, you got a glorious story to tell. 
Ride through the country, ride through the town, tell everybody you see, Jesus is riding with me. I don't understand it at all, why those men would follow that call. They had a reason deep inside for all those miles they chose to ride. Their Bible and saddle were all they the rest. They rode and did their very best. I guess earthly comforts don't matter to a faithful circuit rider. Go ride that trail. You got a glorious story to tell. Ride through the country, ride through the town. Tell everybody you see, Jesus is riding with me. Now I understand it all, why those men follow that call. The reason remains the same, go ride in Jesus' name. There's still folks living in sin, ride Christian women and men. Remember, earthly comforts don't matter to a faithful circuit rider. Go ride that trail, you got a glorious story to tell. Ride through the country, ride through the town, tell everybody you see. Jesus is riding with me. Outdoor preaching was not a new innovation in the wilderness of America. When you think about it, in the Bible, Matthew chapters 5 through 7 record the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was on a hill outside preaching and teaching his disciples. In the Gospels of Luke and John, they record that the crowd was so congested along the shore that he got into a boat and preached from inside of a boat. On the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, it records that as they received the Holy Spirit, the disciples preached in the marketplace. So this was nothing new. In 1729, they formed the Holy Club as Charles and John Wesley were attending college. Now, there was a member of the Holy Club by the name of George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield started preaching outdoors. He had a very powerful voice. Someone said that you could hear him as far as two miles away. Well, something terrible seemed to happen in the Wesley brothers' life. They came to America in 1736, but they were distraught by their missionary efforts. They felt that they did not accomplish anything. A uh, matter of fact, John Wesley said, we went to America to save the Indians and the settlers, but who shall save us? May 21st, 1738, Charles Wesley had a heartwarming experience. And just a few days later, May 24th, 1738, John Wesley had his heartwarming experience. They were on fire for the Lord. They wanted to bring revival within the Church of England, but they banned them from all of the pulpits. What would they do? Well, John Wesley received a letter from his friend George Whitfield to come down to Bristol and to continue his ministry out there. And so he arrived, and on March 29th, 1739, John Wesley preached outdoors. He even said, I submitted to become more 
vile to preach along the highway the plan of salvation. But he saw how wonderful it was to take the gospel from outside of the church walls to meet the people out there where they lived with the message that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. And so all of the circuit riders, in many cases, uh, would preach outdoors wherever they could and share the gospel. A big thing happened in 1801. There was an Irish minister of the Presbyterian Church, James McGrady, who formed the first major camp meeting. And that happened in Canes Ridge over in Kentucky. Uh, he was surprised that 10,000 people showed up for this outdoor revival meeting. Uh, many people traveled by wagon some 100 miles to get there. And so this was a beginning of a great trend of organizing camp meetings. Francis Asbury uh, even participated in camp meetings, and he encouraged all of the circuit riders as they rode along their route to plan a camp meeting. Uh, to say the second week in April, we're going to meet at Swamp Holler. Make sure that you show up for camp meeting days that would last from six days to nine days. Now, a camp meeting occurred at a place that they might call an arbor, and this was created several days before the actual event. Uh, they would find a somewhat level field, and they would clear it off. Uh, some of the trees that were chopped down were made into plank seats. They erected a wooden platform, and on top of that platform, they often had a wooden roof, and it not only protected the speaker from the sun, it worked as a, a projection of sound, uh, kind of like a microphone, uh, so that their voice could be heard. And, of course, they would lead good old camp meeting songs from atop the platform, and then preachers would show up and preach God's Word. It was a great time of a social event where different people in the area could meet their neighbors, uh, and then other preachers could meet uh, their fellow preachers and plan revivals to ask them to come to their church sometime in the future. And it was a great gathering, greatly enjoyed. I will say that the peak of camp meetings was between uh, 1800 to 1860. Now, a lot of people did not have hymn books back in those days, so we had something called camp meeting songs. And I want to share with you one of those camp meeting songs. It was often short and, and just a few words that could be easily learned by everyone present at camp meeting. Give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, it's good enough for me. Give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, give me that old time religion, it's good enough for me. So you see, it was a very short song, and you could easily learn the words. Uh, they would just add another verse. It will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, it will take us all to heaven, it's good enough for me. Camp meetings probably reached the peak of their popularity from 1800 to 1860. Now, it was a very rough life back then. Circuit riders often did not live beyond age 35. We're talking about a wild wilderness with bears, panthers, and mountain lions. There was not too many rules out there, and unfortunately, you might come upon a band of robbers. It was a rough life, but uh, believe it or not, some lived to be a good ripe age. Uh, Pete Cartwright up in Illinois, he lived to be age 72. Bishop Francis Asbury himself lived to be age 71. And when he arrived, he continued in ministry to never return back to England. Uh, he was here from 1771 to 1816. And it's said that he rode about 300,000 miles on horseback in his ministry, in his lifetime, and he preached some 17,000 sermons. He ordained around 4,500 Methodist ministers. 
And so thank you for joining us today. Uh, we have enjoyed looking back in history at the circuit riders and the importance of their lives. I'd like to share with you another song that I wrote about circuit riders in closing. I'm a circuit rider on these earthly plains. I'll stay in the saddle, let Jesus take the reins. No matter what the weather, my horse and I will go. The message is greater than rain, sleet, or snow. I'll ride on God's trail. Jesus' love I will tell. Till all see the sun, I'll ride on, I'll ride on. I carry a package for greater than gold, packed with precious power to save the saddest soul. Just open your hearts, say I believe, then eternal life you receive. I'll ride on God's trail, Jesus' love I will tell, till all see the sun, I'll ride on, I'll ride on, I'll ride on, I'll ride on. Let us close with a good old circuit rider prayer that I heard a few years back. So let's bow our heads and join together. Dear Lord, give me a backbone bigger than a saw log and make my ribs like the beams under the church floor. Give me steel shoes and galvanized britches. And bring me a wagon load of determination to stack all the way up to the highest end of the gable of my soul. And let me sign a contract to fight the devil, to fight him as long as I have vision, to bite him as long as I have a tooth, and then gum him till I die. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining our service this week. We need more circuit riders, people to get outside of the walls of the church and to go and share the gospel with whoever you meet. God bless you, and we will see you again.